Welcome to Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Discussions on gear, technique, industry news, and interviews with the best in the business. Now, here are your hosts, Rich Baum and Brian Berkowitz. Hello and welcome to Shooting Spaces. This is Brian from New York. And Rich Baum from Sacramento, California. And we want to thank everybody for joining us for another fantastic episode with another great guest. But before we do, Rich, tell me uh, tell me a little bit about what's going on. We have a, It's a Monday today that we're recording, so it's a little earlier in the week. Um, you got a busy schedule coming up. What's what's new with you? Yeah, it's, it's like the uh, middle of summer. I guess they call it the dog days of summer, and it's uh, been great out here in California. Unfortunately, well, it's it's not terrible, but it's it's been about a hundred to one hundred and three every day. We're, but it's a, it's a nice heat, and it's probably not as bad as it's been in New York. I hear it's been rainy out there and and really miserable. Yeah, this week is supposed to rain all week, and I have a bunch of shoots scheduled that I probably will have to postpone. But it is what it is. I mean, last week we had a a nice week; just the humidity was unbearable last week. But um, you know, mm-hmm. go out yeah. and you try get in the heat. So yeah, and I, I've been doing all kinds of. <clears throat> excuse me, I've been doing. Uh, I've been shooting uh, on Saturday. I photographed the. Uh, I, I work for a company that does uh, races, ten uh, Ks, marathon, ultras, and we photographed the final year of the oldest triathlon in the world. It called the Epi's Great Race, and it is uh, running, bike riding, and paddling. Wow. So it was really bittersweet because it was something it's a it's a very famous race and it's the end of 45 years so wow, i was really uh, pleased to be on on the crew to photograph the uh, the race and it was How a lot of fun doing it i have only actually shot epis one time because oh. i'm always doing weddings uh in the summer on saturdays and now i've kind of i've scaled my weddings back and um i i was available this time so i i was happy to do it and uh, I just, I mean, I love sports and uh, race photography, but uh, it was really fun. And, and it's something I, I urge everybody when I hear people in the groups or people I talk to, uh, real estate photographers, and they are like, that's all they shoot is real estate photography. I, I can't even imagine not shooting everything because I just love shooting all kinds of things, people and places and, and landscape and, and sports. So. Shooting everything, the new podcast shooting everything well uh, i don't know i don't know about that but uh, so um have you anyway, been have well, you been I, shooting a lot of uh, a lot of houses in the rain have you been busy yeah i mean i've been doing a lot of drone lately so that i had to you know a lot of those shoots have to be postponed obviously but other than that yeah i've been shooting it's been busy last week was was jam-packed today's a, this week's a little slower i just came from a shoot and got a couple more towards the end of the week um and i'm shooting like you said shooting everything i i'm shooting for one of my oldest clients something i dread but i've been doing it every year and it's really good money i shoot for i shoot product for an antique company and they have me come out every august and we do about five or six days of shooting and we're just shooting their inventory and cataloging their inventory and to be honest i hate it i can't stand it but you know it pays good and i uh, go in and i just uh, grind it out so i have that coming up the end of the week and next week so that sounds good right there shooting everything so mm-hmm. great and uh let's uh let's get to it because we have a lot to discuss today um we have a g- great guest so um i'll let you uh, introduce him Okay, well, it's it's um, a guest that I've known for, uh, not personally, we've never met, but I've known for, gosh, must be going on seven, eight years now. And he's um, someone I've always respected, highly respected. He doesn't uh, participate a lot in the group, so a lot of people may not be aware or familiar with this person. Um, but I want to want to really urge everybody to check out his website, check out his work, follow him if you can, because he, he's one of the most interesting and diverse uh, real estate or, uh, you know, design real estate architectural photographers I know. And his name is Dan Milstein out of New York. I think he's on Long Island. And I want to welcome you, Dan, to uh, the Shooting Spaces Thanks podcast. Thanks so much, Rich. Yeah, I'm actually in Westchester County. I, I try and stay uh, as far from Long Island as I can. <laughs> Where is that? Is that like north of yeah, New I, York? I, I live north? about 30 miles north of New York City. Okay. 
You're, awesome. only, the, you're only one county like north of Long Island, theoretically, though. So it's not so <laughs> it's not so far. You're you're just over a bridge. You're not so getting far ugly. away. Getting ugly right from the start. I love it. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. So Dan, tell us if you would just for a minute, um, you know, tell us uh, your website. Tell us um, what you would just in a in a nutshell what you would call what you do, and let's go into uh, some de- sure. details. Well, the website's at milsteinphoto.com. I'm sure you'll have a link here. Um, I specialize in uh, shooting luxury property for marketing, uh, both on the ground and from the air. Uh, started about uh, that was about ten years ago now. And I was doing some uh, back of the napkin math and realized I've shot close uh, close to or just over ten billion dollars worth of property. I was kind of stunned by the number. Wow! But that's that's uh, at least three or four homes. I uh, well, two or three, but you know it helps for every uh, for every three million dollar home. Uh, I can't say that I have one that's in the you know fifty to one twenty range, but uh, you shoot one hundred and twenty million dollar estate, and it kind of <laughs> skews the number a little bit. <laughs> Great. And when you said you do uh, aerial photography, tell them I know what you do, but I really wanted to bring you on because of all the things I, I know that you do. I, I really love it because everybody's all excited about drones and this and that. What do you shoot from? What do you I, well, fly? <laughs> I, I started out by putting a GoPro in my head, flapping, ar- flapping my arms really hard. I, just, <laughs> I didn't get very far. Uh, some good pictures of my lawn really face first. No, I, I started in 2009. <laughs> I started in, uh, in a helicopter. Uh, a buddy of mine, Phil Scott, called me up and said, hey, listen, I got to shoot some aerials. I said, you know, people have been asking me about them, too. And we were we were both just getting going. And uh, he said, all right, I'll, I'll find a I'll find a helicopter for us. All right. No problem. I get a message from him the next day. Hey, Dan. All right. We're going to go. Uh, we're going to go in a helicopter out of Danbury Municipal <laughs> Airport. I found a little uh, little service that was Centennial Helicopters. I've been flying with them ever since. And uh, that was it. We, we got in, had no idea what we were getting into, um, brought a couple of lenses, made, I think, more mistakes than anything else. But each mistake was really an opportunity to figure out what we needed for the next flight. But it is the helicopter makes it an expensive learning curve. Uh, you either learn quickly or you have to be well funded or just broke. Uh, those are really wow. the options. But. I mean, even a, a small helicopter, the R44 that we fly in is a, uh, it's a four seat helicopter. The pilot takes one, we take two. Uh, and then that last seat, it's normally for gear, but uh, they range anywhere from about $500 an hour on the very low end nationally to uh, as high as about 750 to 775 an hour. And that's engine running time. Uh, so, you know, warm up, cool down, all included. Wow, I'm <clears throat> I'm uh, I want to go there. I want to join you one day uh, to to do that. I've been in helicopter many times, um, but not shooting myself. And what I want to ask you is is why would you choose to? Because as you can look at maybe the advantages of it, I could almost think that a lot of people are listening, going, "Well, but you got to go to an airport. You got to do this. You got to do that." What are some of the advantages um, or the situations that we might not be aware of that you have uh, flying a, a real helicopter? Uh, helicopter versus drone, let's say. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, there are actually some, uh, some real advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, the primary advantage of a helicopter, or the two primary advantages, are altitude. Um, flying a drone commercially, you're limited to 400 feet above the ground. Flying in a helicopter, you're limited to... Mm-hmm the performance of the helicopter and, you know, whatever airspace you're in. But uh, for uh, property shooting, there's really no uh, no limit in the helicopter except for how low and slow you can go. Uh, mm-hmm. But for a helicopter, the biggest advantage is that you can cover a lot of ground. Um, I would, in a single uh, two and a half hour flight, I could cover anywhere from uh, 20 to 24, 26 properties, somewhere in there, depending on how spread out they were. I couldn't do that from the ground in a day if I tried, let alone in several hours. The, uh, the trade-off is that when you're up in the helicopter, uh, you know, let's say you're paying 600 bucks an hour. So $10 a minute. How long do you really want to search for a house when you're in the air? So preparation is everything. And mm-hmm. it's days of confirming, okay, this is the right house. These are the right coordinates. You send photos to the agent, you know, the, the uh, Google or Bing, satellite or uh you know 
well, now you can get the 3D versions, but send them something to confirm. And even with all that, sometimes we got the wrong houses. Um, I almost think using a drone for your location scouting might be a big advantage to you. Uh, yes, but the cost of scouting with a drone, if you think about it, you've got to go out to each location. The mm -hmm. cost of going to each location, unless you're in a very, very tight geographic area, uh, takes that out. You really you lose all of the advantages of the helicopter except for altitude you lose all of the advantages mm -hmm. when uh, you actually go to the location first now if it's a property that i shot on the ground first and the agent you know in the past asked me about aerials uh, i'd say right, i'll let you know when we're going up on a uh, on a helicopter run um, there are some limitations with the helicopter uh, i did mention before you know low and slow isn't really an option um, you know, we, we did have someone in our uh, community, uh, fortunately, survive barely a uh, helicopter crash, but uh, something called the dead man's curve. And if you're if you're behind it, uh, behind the performance of the helicopter and the engine cuts out uh, or for any reason you lose lift, um, well, you turn it to a smoking hole in the ground. So uh, you really, you know, you're limited by the performance of the aircraft and you've got to uh, you've got to go with that. That's where drones really excel. Uh, you can sit there and hover at 20 feet off the ground, 50 feet, 70 feet, 100, 200 feet, whatever. And you really don't have to worry about uh, anything except for how long your battery lasts. Sure. And I think the altitude is a big thing. I'm, I don't know if you know this, Dan, I'm a drone pilot. I'm a licensed pilot. And I've been licensed about a year and a half now. And I probably shot a little over 100 properties so far. And you know, I shoot on the North Shore, the Gold Coast of Long Island, so all my properties are pretty big over there also. Um, but there's, you know, probably out of the 100 I've shot, there's maybe 5 to 10 properties that were 20 or 30 acres or over that I could not get the whole property in my 400-foot altitude Absolutely. limit. So while 90 95% of them, it's not an issue, you know, if I'm shooting one, two, three acres, but every so often you get to that estate where it's 30 acres and there's just only so much you can do to get that property in. So there's definitely an advantage there when you are shooting these big, <laughs> gigantic estates to getting as high as you can get. I got to ask you a pretty silly question here. You uh, didn't by any sure. chance shoot the uh, monstrous estate on Pond Road, did you? Potentially. <laughs> which, which one are you doing? Uh, patterned granite in the, uh, in the driveway, uh, very ornate. Uh, gold front doors. There are three uh, three houses. Okay, no, that yeah, wasn't that's, me. Uh, we'll, we'll, I've shot on Pond Road before, but that doesn't that doesn't sound. <laughs> we'll talk about that sometime. <laughs> yes, the gold doors and the ornate granite would have uh, would have probably. I'm sh assuming. Oh, you, my eyes, you wouldn't uh, have missed it. You would have looked at it and said, "Wow, that's um, okay." Uh, yeah, it's actually <laughs> it's uh, several feet, and I do mean several feet outside of the uh, the surface class B for uh, for LaGuardia. So uh, we were barely, this is, uh, I guess, three or four years ago, we were barely able to cover that with the uh, drone. And even still, uh, someone, I guess, called the uh, the police and an NYPD helicopter showed up. Um, we weren't doing anything illegal, but uh, we we had to ground the, uh, the operations pretty quickly. Wow. Yeah, I know that area is very tricky. I'm assuming you have very, very similar things because you have Westchester, LaGuardia is fairly close, and I know Westchester has a small local airport too. Yeah, Westchester's, uh, uh, they've got uh, this class D airspace for, uh, you know, anyone out there who actually knows what it is, but it's it's not bad. And I will say that before the, uh, the latest regulations went in a couple of years ago, uh, the folks in the tower were really quite good at coordinating. Uh, mm -hmm. And we would, we'd be able to give them a call and they would set us up with uh, a little window keep us out of trouble it worked pretty well i bet it's a lot to do with the uh, pilot you have too good relationships no, both both the helicopter and the drone um I, you know I, I will say that there are some areas where uh it seems that the folks in the tower are more interested in something other than separating aircraft but i will say that at westchester and uh really all the new york area airports uh they're fantastic about just making things work Maybe they'll catch this podcast. <laughs> we can only hope. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> hey, Dan, let me ask you um, because I'm the uh, I'm the non drone uh, guy in this uh, outfit. Uh, Brian Brian always talks about drones. I know a lot about them, but uh, I kind of don't do it anymore. But uh, I just wanted to ask you, what kind of equipment are you using in the helicopter? That's something I'd like to know. First of all, 
what is the uh, minimum height you can get and <clears throat> excuse me in, in a in a normal airspace and what kind of uh, lenses cameras are you using because i would like to know i just have no idea i would think you'd almost want to use a uh, 70 to 200 or a 300 up sure. up there and and what do you use uh it really i when i first started out i i think i had the uh, what was it a uh 24 to 120 or something like that it was a horrible lens um 24105 you canon no 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 nikon nikon Oh, yeah, okay. it was a uh, uh, it was an awful lens. At least that version was. Anyway, I, most of the time in the uh, in the helicopter, uh, well, first we're shooting out the left side. Both doors are removed, front and back. Whoever's in the back is getting buffeted by horrible winds. Whoever's in the front is enjoying the ride. Um, and I would take up two cameras, uh, one with a twenty four to seventy, and one with a seventy to two hundred. If I was shooting alone, uh, that or the twenty eight to three hundred image quality is not as good though. Uh, just not as rich. And if we had uh, two people, if I had uh, a second shooter in the back, one of us would shoot 24 to 70 and the other would shoot uh, 70 to 200 so that we could really capture everything on a single orbit if possible, uh, you know, and save save another 10 or 20 bucks for doing the orbit, another orbit. Uh, as far as stabilizing cameras, well, that's where it gets fun. Uh, shooting the 70 to 200 we were looking for shutter speeds minimum of yeah, close to like an 800th of a second any slower than that you're really risking uh, uh you're risking a lot of blur so uh, you know we'd shoot at uh f4 which from 500 feet really isn't an issue um auto iso and then we'd we'd set shutter speeds to try and hold it an 800th or faster um and then for darker shoots, uh, yeah, we did a few years ago, we did New York City, uh, New Year's Eve, very cold. Um, but remember, the helicopter is still moving. We've got to stabilize as much as possible. So I have a couple of uh, Kenyan Laboratories uh, gyro stabilizers, uh, the uh, 4x4 and the KS 6x6. Uh, they just stabilize different weights and have different panning rates. So if we're uh, shooting video for any reason, we can choose appropriately. Not a cheap way to get into doing aerials. Uh, <laughs> nighttime is uh, it's a bit of a crapshoot. But outside of the night shooting, uh, really no specialized equipment. Uh, you know, any reasonably fast lens and uh, any camera that can, I highly recommend uh, a camera that will uh, bracket at a, a decent clip. Because um, if you're flying safely, you know, by the time you get through a slow set of three or five shots, uh, you've, you know, orbited maybe uh, a quarter of an arc. So that's just one thing. And what is the minimum height you can get in a helicopter? Uh, safely or legally? Legally. <laughs> we always okay. do legally on the uh, well, show. Well, there's <laughs> I have to... actually safely and legally are both going to be legal. Um, mm -hmm. However, one of them isn't really wise. Uh, it is as low as the pilot feels is safe. And that's only for a helicopter. In a fixed wing, you've got some limitations there, and uh, they can really be a problem. You've, you've got to maintain higher altitudes, but in a, uh, a rotary wing aircraft, any kind of helicopter, uh, you can really, uh, you know, you can get down almost to the deck, provided that the pilot feels that it's safe. Mm. Remember, yeah. though, the pilot's not going to say, hey, this is safe flying at 100 feet uh, over, uh, you know, over the woods surrounding a house that doesn't have much of a yard. Mm -hmm. If something happens, you're not going down safely. Um, so most of the time, uh, if we were over land, we'd maintain 500 feet. And if we're over water, uh, well, our record was 24 and a half feet, but I think we were flying at 90 knots at the time. So still safe. Okay, great. And are you, you're completely, uh, describe the safety aspects, because I know from a lot of experience in the motion picture industry, I used to outfit uh, the uh, helicopters and, and prop helicopters and, um, I mean, props as in, property uh for i was a yes. prop master but um i would always have to deal with the safety aspect and so you're completely harnessed in your cameras harnessed in what do you what do you think what are you dealing with safety wise <laughs> well because we're shooting from the left side of the helicopter uh we have to deal with the risk of uh anything that we have hitting the tail rotor and a tail rotor strike um 
I can't promise you that we'd get down safely, so we'd either be uh, going to the hospital or at the very least, <laughs> if we hit the tail rotor with something, we'd be taking a taxi back to the airport. And we never want to do that. Um, so uh, the first thing we do is we make sure that all of our gear is secured. Uh, every camera has a strap that does not come off of us. Um, I've actually been using the uh, the Black Rapid straps. Uh, you know, just put a lug in the bottom of the camera. Uh, forget about those little D-rings on the side. Screw something in and strap that around my leg, uh, my left mm -hmm. leg, so that it's, uh, you know, right by the opening to the helicopter. Uh, things like lens hoods uh, have to be, they have to be secured. Um, if you've got to go to yeah, a lot of gaff tape just to keep it from rotating off. Uh, the trick is that you need to stay inside the helicopter. Now, while there's no door, there is a wall of air. And when mm. you're flying at, even if it's 40 knots in a, you know, a relatively slow orbit around a property, if just the, the front edge of your lens gets out into the airstream there, uh, you're going to take a camera to the face pretty hard. And I do that once a flight. Um, it's, I've never been bruised, <laughs> but I do that once a flight. And I get an eye socket full of, uh, full of viewfinder. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, the, the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the safety equipment, everyone sees the harnesses, uh, you know, out the side of a, uh, a sliding door jet ranger, or, you know, one of the larger helicopters, the AS350. Uh, the Robinson is a little different. Um, first, it's kind of like flying a, an inverted lawnmower uh and second it's just a seatbelt. it's a three-point harness you put the seatbelt on and there's absolutely oh heck it would be difficult to fall out without the seat belt it would be very difficult to fall out the uh the forces inside the helicopter when you're turning push you into your seat um so it's really uh, not a big deal and there's no feeling at all of uh you know of risk uh when you're just seat belted in there, but as long as the equipment's secured, you're uh, you're in pretty good shape. Yeah, I'm cool. looking at pictures of uh, the Robinson R44 now online, and that thing looks small. It, it is. Wow. Uh, look up pictures of the Robinson R22. Uh, I've done one flight in one of those, and I swear my left shoulder was sticking out most Oof. of the time, uh, and I couldn't keep anything in any of my right hand jacket pockets uh, because it would interfere with the uh, the pilot's ability to raise the collective so that uh <laughs> that was a no -go. It, it looks like it looks like one of those little smart cars with propellers uh, you know when i got into it i really <laughs> that was the first time in any aircraft that i i had the sensation of not being in an aircraft while flying um it was wow. you know just just taxiing i don't think a, a lot of people know this but helicopters actually uh they at, at an airport do taxi on taxiways and they take off down the runway uh you know they, they follow the established traffic patterns and uh, not too, uh, not too weird, except for the fact that we're not rolling on the ground. We're hovering about, you know, six to 10 feet above it. But man, in that, that R22, it felt like I was outside. Yeah, I'm looking, I, you know, and I invite anyone to take a look at Google Images, R22 helicopter. There's a, there's an image there. I guess it's a fisheye taken from inside with, you know, two people in the front seat and, both their outer shoulders are squished against the window and their inner shoulders are squished against each yeah, that's, other. Uh, like, that sounds <laughs> right. Take the door off the left side and uh, just let your shoulder expand out. It's really uh, exactly. a lot of, I actually took one of those around Manhattan. Uh, I was shooting some video and trying to stabilize it. Even with, uh, even with one of the Kenyan gyros, it was nearly impossible to uh, hold anything with a log lens. And where would you suggest somebody that's not necessarily going to actually go through with doing some helicopter photography, but where would you suggest to just kind of learn more about it? What's the website you're on, uh, on, uh, now, Brian, to, to I'm just on Google people. images. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I was just, look I was looking up, I literally typed in R22 helicopter <clears throat> on Google images and it's like the fifth row down. There's like that fish eye image from inside the, uh, is it called the cockpit in the helicopter too? Sure. Yeah. So inside the cockpit and it, everyone's just squished against each other. Does not look pleasant. It's it's definitely <laughs> not even the back seat in the R forty four the four seat version. Uh, it's not the most um, it's not the most comfortable flight. Uh, if you're a little bit taller or have bigger feet or you know you have four people in the helicopter and you have a little bit of extra equipment, uh, you're going to feel a little tight. Uh, whoever's sitting in the front does have plenty of leg room, 
but that's as far as you go for comfort. Oh, they, they are. They're also heated, which is great for, you know, winter flights when you're, <laughs> yeah, it's below freezing. It's uh, New Year's Eve. And yeah, the, yeah the, the heat cranks on those. Not that it matters. <laughs> I know there are a dozen people out there that are shaking their head going, He's crazy, man. I could just take up my drone. It's like when I when I talk about using a pole for my pole photography, which to me is the appropriate thing to use. They're all going, oh, that's so stupid. Just take up your drone. <laughs> it's so funny. You know, there's some yeah, people. Oh, there are definitely places you can't take a drone. Um, you know, there are mm-hmm. there are certain sections around airports where you can't get clearance no matter what you know no matter what you want to do because it's right on a traffic pattern uh the the only sure i can dan i can't fly in my neighborhood i'm i'm about three miles from jfk and the traffic pattern's right above me i can't i'm not yeah, there's, there's no way never flown in my neighborhood yet <laughs> you'd need to uh you need to be in a helicopter for that so that the helicopter pilot could coordinate live with uh with air traffic control mm-hmm. to keep that safe uh, there's a few of those in uh, in the area where i shoot uh right around westchester county County airport uh there's just a, a couple of neighborhoods where it's it's really tight but the other reason i mean we talked about this before is altitude uh, i got a call to shoot as a 120 million dollar property on the connecticut coast and it's a whole island um I, i'm actually starting to enjoy the islands but the island was big enough so that there was really no way to capture it by drone and my client knew that and my client asked specifically about uh, doing it in a helicopter and of course i I jumped at the chance because I love getting in the helicopter. It's fun. Um, but, you know, for that, we did uh, three orbits on that one. One was at just a couple of hundred feet, uh, but very fast so that we were, you know, we'd stay ahead of the dead man's curve. Uh, one at about 500. And then we took it up to about a thousand feet. And it was the shots from a thousand feet that ended up being of the greatest value. Uh, and for that, we were shooting the uh, 24 to 70. Didn't have any kind of gyro stabilizers on that flight. It was uh, close to midday, you know, summer sun. Not really a, a big deal to, uh, or a big challenge to maintain the faster shutter speeds. I did shoot an island actually on the North Shore of Long Island similarly last year. And, um, you know, I never even thought to even try to sell an aerial helicopter shoot to my client because I had the drone and it, that process didn't even cross my mind, to be honest. And I could not capture the whole thing. I mean, the only way for me to capture the whole thing was to stay below my 400 foot altitude range, but go out further as far as my diameter was concerned, just to be able to capture the whole thing and go out further and further. But then I wasn't getting higher. So it was kind of like shooting flat land instead sure. of down. Um, but you know, now that we've had this conversation and that whole thought process is in my head, maybe that's something if, if those inquiries come, I would definitely, uh, try to introduce to the client to see what, uh, if that's something there's a, with the, uh, uh, you know, with the slowly maturing, uh, you know, drone technology or quickly maturing drone technology out there, uh, there are some business concerns in considering both the helicopter and the drones that anyone who's looking at this should really consider. And the first is, uh, the cost of shooting a single property with a drone versus a helicopter is enormous, especially if it's, you know, reasonably local for you. Uh, if it's a property that you're shooting on the ground, you can put a drone up while you're there. Uh, you've got no prep time because you don't have to find the property. You're there. Uh, your client can, uh, actually monitor what you're shooting. Uh, you know, and if you're just starting out and you've got just an iPhone or an iPad that you're using as your, uh, as your monitor for the, the drone client can look over your shoulder. Um, I use a, a, a separate monitor with a, a wireless link so that my client really isn't on top of me. And, uh, you know, I can say, all right, uh, here's, here's what I think. Uh, is there anything that I'm missing on this property or uh, something similar? The helicopter first, unless you're taking your client with you, you can't get that kind of live feedback. So you have to, you have to guess what your client wants. And that's tough for an aerial because the client probably has never seen the property from the air either, at least not in this kind mm-hmm. of detail. Uh, but the other really big thing is if you're shooting a single property, the cost of getting to the airport, doing the prep, and let's say you've been to the property so you know what it looks like. The prep is going to be minimal. Grab the coordinates while you're there. Boom, you're done. Um, but 
you've got the time of getting to the airport, the time in preparing in the helicopter, uh, you know, strapping things in, et cetera, getting warmed up, flying to the property, orbiting the property, getting back, landing, cool down. Uh, by the time you're done, most services have a one hour minimum anyway. By the time you're done, just the cost of your ride is somewhere between, let's say, you know, 500 and 775. And mm -hmm. then you've got the cost yeah. of your time and licensing the photos. Uh, so you end up with something that, uh, you know, at the very minimum, even if you live right next to the airport, you're talking, uh, you know, 900 to maybe uh, 1500 for a single shot. So it, it has to be... It has to be a, a fairly substantial uh, reason to use the hell. Yeah, I have a property. I, look, I, if it's if it's my house and the only way that I can get it shot is, uh, you know, if I'm selling my house, the only way I can get it shot is by helicopter. I'd pay that, but I know mm -hmm. what I'm going to get. Uh, uh, you know, for an agent who's working on a commission, isn't even guaranteed to get that commission because they don't know if they're going to be able to see it through. It's an average of two point seven listing agents to sell a property. Um, it's a tough call, and the, the less expensive the uh, the asking price on the house, uh, the more likely it is that the helicopter is not going to be the solution. Um, it, it's just not uh, it's not cost effective <laughs> unless you're shooting a large number of properties uh, relative to the mm -hmm. time you're in the air. So when you get a call or you plan on doing a shoot, you're probably out there trying to coordinate other. Um, other locations from different agents? If it's a, if I'm doing a helicopter run, uh, I will talk to my other clients. Uh, and I work with a lot of marketing departments uh, in addition to some individual agents. And I'll talk to the marketing department and say, hey, listen, I'm going to be in this area with the helicopter. Do you have anything? Do you need anything? Mm, uh, yeah. Most common now is if I go up for a single property, I'll also shoot stock in the area because I do get requests. Mm -hmm. You know, Greenwich. I get a lot of requests for the, the Greenwich Coast or Westport or whatever it is. And if I have some stock from the helicopter, I can license those photos out and help not just create additional revenue for myself, but uh, help reduce the cost of the uh, helicopter work for the initial commissioning client. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you finally mentioned something I can jump in. I, my family is from my uh, mother's sisters from uh, Westport, so I spent a lot of time in Westport growing up. So it's a beautiful place. Well, I, I would apologize for making noise all these years, but uh, I probably, probably wasn't flying <laughs> over it at the time. Just the, uh, Paul Newman, you'd have to apologize <laughs> to, but he's not around. So I wanted to uh, move on because there's so much we could talk about and there's only so much time. But, uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking, Dan, um, <clears throat> if because you're I look at you and, and your work is the top of where you want to be, what you're doing, what you're you know, what I would like to be doing, aspiring to. But what can you give any um, any uh, tips and tricks or, or just suggestions or ideas or things to work on for the photographers that are either getting started or just doing day to day real estate and want to break into really more substantial uh, real estate and architectural and other photography. What do you have to say to some of these photographers? Um, I, well, I, let's let's start with the uh, the low hanging fruit here, breaking into architecture. And I don't mean to uh, suggest that it's easy to break into the, uh, you know, the, the commercial side of things, shooting architecture directly for the architect or for designer. But uh, before you even consider that, uh, you really need to look at a substantial volume of architectural photography and what the architects are using to make sure that your photos are uh, are on par with what they're using. Mm -hmm. And then if you're going to try and get the business, you have to have an advantage. So uh, either your work is better uh, or your turnaround time is better. Uh, I never recommend uh, trying to get business solely based on cost. That just makes it a race to the bottom. But uh, if your work is worth it, uh, then it's really just a sales game, and that's it's that mm -hmm. simple. It's it's uh, you know presenting yourself in the right way persistently over a period of time, and uh, you know you, you build those clients up one at a time. Uh, easiest way to you know to really start to get there is to start looking for more luxury property to shoot. Now I know that's not going to be possible in all markets, so. Uh, you know, the, the advice might be, uh, you know, might be limited to some places, but I, look, I'm in the New York Metro luxury property around here is kind of like air. Uh, 
uh, it's it's really all around us. So uh, getting a call for a three, five, or even $10 million house is not unusual. Uh, go up the coast, you know, just an hour and a half, and you start losing those quickly. Um, but there's, you know, there's something that resembles luxury property in every in every market. Um, and it's really just putting yourself in front of those agents instead of the agents who are selling or trying to, uh, you know, trying to market the more modestly priced houses or what I would call most of the country. Um, for me, I launched my business and said, I'm going to shoot luxury property. So I went to agents, not to office meetings, because the agents selling these luxury properties typically aren't at the office meetings. Uh, I went to the agents directly and said, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to give you a sample of what I do. Uh, and I'd make sure that they were agents who were using reasonable photography already, because if they were using absolute garbage, uh, there was no chance that they were going to spend money to improve their photography. Um, you know, it's the, the least efficient way to sell uh, anything is to go after people who don't really see the need for what you have. So if you go to someone who already has decent photography and you can do something that they're not currently getting, whether it's better photos or, again, faster turnaround, um, and I'm leaving price out of the equation entirely because it's, it, it yeah. should be nearly irrelevant in this process. Um, once you get someone to say, yeah, I'd like to see what you can do, um, you know, then you, uh, you, you've scored. Uh, just make sure that you actually uh, prove yourself that you deliver. deliver. Now, I go out, uh, originally, I used to work by myself, but, uh, you know, a couple of rounds of back surgery later, uh, I always work with a, uh, I always work with an assistant. And, uh, you know, usually the, uh, usually the same person with a, a few people who fill in. And um, my, my first assistant is a photographer, has been for about 15 years, uh, and is incredible at working with me to, get a shoot just done. Now, if I say here, okay, two hours is, uh, is quick. I know that a lot of people are going to say, wait, two, I can't spend two hours on a shoot. I go out of business. I need to do, you know, more than that during a day. Remember that with luxury property, the, uh, the license fees are higher, so we can do fewer properties, but, uh, a lot of the agents were used to three, four, five, six hour shoots. And we come in, we're doing the same, <clears throat> photo quantity uh frequently with better quality in less time and mm -hmm. it was that was actually enough to get uh, uh you know entire agencies to uh start recommending me instead of whoever they had been using for a decade or more time is money time is money and yeah. if you can tell an agent to listen you, you don't uh you yeah. know we're not going to hold you up for more than x amount of time and you make sure that you do that uh it's it's gold. It's gold. Uh, and yeah. I, you know, the number of times that I've heard that over the, uh, I'm going to say over the last five years is significant enough. So I would yeah. put that kind of on the top of the list after, uh, you know, right after photo quality. Mm -hmm. And I want to just let me jump in one more thing. I just want to really impress to people that when I have an opportunity to get a uh, a job that is not real estate photography is is whatever it would be. It would be commercial or it would be uh, whatever. I first thing I do is I try and even before I talk to them, let's say I get a message, I'll try and go to their website and look and see are they used to what is their expectation? Are they using professional photographers or are they using garbage? And that is absolutely the best sign that you can uh, you can quote accordingly, or you want to work for sure. this person or this well, sales, sales one hundred and one. Yeah. Know your client or, yeah. or your prospect. Sure. And on that point, on that point that you just said, Rich, and what you said earlier, Dan, I think it's so important. And I made this mistake and was guilty when I was starting out of trying to sell myself to agents who didn't have professional photography. And the response from every single one of them was, "My iPhone pictures are fine." And as you said, having or, or trying to sell yourself to an agent that already has some sort of professional photography, whether good, bad, or any other kind, at least they know and they're used to paying for it and they can appreciate better photography. So yeah, I definitely, I think that's, that's very, one of the most valuable things you've said here today is when you're trying to sell yourself um, to new agents, 
don't go after the agents that necessarily do not have professional photography at all. Um, go after, I mean, if you do that, you might have to end up doing a free shoot just to, to show them the difference, I guess. But, um, go with the ones that have inferior photography. So they're already paying, they understand the value of pain and then just try to sure. wow them. No, I, I absolutely mm -hmm. agree. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the I'm going to say growing trend toward HDR, uh, was really kind of an opportunity for me. Uh, when I first got into this, it was uh, you know, typical for a luxury property was six shots. And so I came in and I did a couple of free shoots for a couple of different agents. But it was actually a, a friend of mine, an agent who said, I, I really I don't like the photos I have for this house. Can you come in and can you come in and do something? And so I came in. and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, I could shoot anything <laughs> except spaces. And uh, I went in and I, I gave it a shot after, I'm going to say about five hours of reading. And I had stumbled across, uh, you know, Larry Lorman's site, photographyforrealestate.net, uh, after finding that Flickr group, which is also how I connected with some other photographers, but uh, it's a story for later. Um, but I, I went in and kind of absorbed the basics. I didn't need the basics for photography. I needed the basics for how to shoot a space. And there were a few people who were active in the group who gave fantastic advice. Um, you know, this was, this was back before uh, people were used to posting images and getting just praise. This was when you could actually post an image uh, for comments and critique and get really solid comments and critique from experienced photographers. And so I took all of that to heart. Uh, I shot it once, posted my photos, got feedback from some fantastic photographers at the time with experience in the field and very quickly adapted my style to fit both the luxury market and what I would consider the conventions of architectural photography. And it worked. Uh, I had a, a very happy friend slash client who then recommended me to her marketing department. Um, and I, I kept in contact with the uh, the right folks, and over the course of about two years, uh, managed to. I almost hate to say this, I displaced other photographers, but that's business. Um, my goal was not to displace them; my goal was just to pick up market share. I guess that's the same thing. It just sounds nicer, but it worked. And uh, I, you know, all I needed to do was consistently produce. And what did I do that was different? I did fifteen shots instead of six. And I delivered them in, at the time, two business days at a maximum, usually just the next day. Uh, and that wasn't something they were used to. So they were getting good quality, uh, usually better, because I had really gone out of my way to, uh, you know, to make sure that I was doing it right. Uh, they were getting it fast, and uh, they were not getting it at a, dis at a discount. And were you shooting it? You said you, sh you were shooting well, HDR? No, it's funny. I wasn't shooting HDR, uh, but... It was just starting to become a thing. And this is uh, this about 10 years ago, uh, at least commercially. And the trend toward HDR uh, over the past 10 years has opened up even more opportunities for me because, um, well, I'm sure you've heard a lot of the nicknames for bad HDR. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, you know, starting with clown or unicorn, but all involving rainbows, bad colors, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Glad you guys are with me on this. Um, so to deliver something that actually had accurate color. And yeah. at the, t now at the time, I was, I was doing almost everything uh, in camera. So it was, uh, you know, multiple speed lights. I, had a, I, I got up to one point, I, had, I think I had 13 SB80s. Um, it's dwindled over the years. I've gone with uh, <laughs> gone with larger lights and a lot of heavy compositing. Uh, but again, heavy compositing is something that uh, you really have to have the budget for. Charge more, shoot fewer properties, etc. But the mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the cheaper way to do it is HDR, which is why you know it, or some kind of exposure fusion, which is why it got so popular. Um, but I, I do read the reason I brought it up is I do read people saying on I read about people online saying ah, yeah, I can't compete with these folks on price. They're doing a property for whatever, and I just can't do that. And my answer to anyone with that concern is, that's right. 
you can't. Uh, these are folks who are working on volume alone. Uh, they may or may mm-hmm. not be profitable. And uh, you need to consider that. Uh, and a lot of them are upselling too. They're making their money on floor plans sure. and Matterport and things so like that. So if your goal is to, uh, you know, is to do this primarily on the, uh, the merits of your photography, uh, your photos have to be substantially better. And while there are people who turn out absolutely acceptable results using uh, exposure fusion, uh, automated exposure fusion, it's not going to be acceptable at a certain level. Yes, there are some agents in the ultra luxury markets who do use bad photography, uh, but by and large, most of them have some dollars coming in from their agencies, uh, or they just know that to to compete and get the listings, they've got to have better photos. And that's where, you know, that's where I stepped in, and it was intentional. It wasn't that I was better; I was doing it differently, and I looked at what their challenges were and what the agents wanted i talked to agents uh you know mm-hmm. what uh, what do you need well you know we get good pictures from this guy but it's six hours and we don't get the pictures for a week and we don't get enough pictures all right you know look at the uh, look at the cost of producing yeah. either producing a few more pictures uh which at the time that was easy uh you know going from six to 15 was not a uh, was not a big deal going from uh, you know, 25 to let's say 50 or 100 is ridiculous uh, unless someone's willing to uh, to really shell out. But it was just mm-hmm. giving them what they uh, what they had been looking for, um, not creating a new market, but stepping in where things like automated HDR were failing. But there's one I got to just jump in here. And there was one person on the uh, PFRE group, the Flickr group. And uh, he was always the best. And his name started with a C. Who is that? The HDR master. The HDR master. Colin. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think uh, it was Colin Cato from never, England. He, never he did was spill the secret amazing. sauce, though. <laughs> he was going to make a video, and I was so excited. And he never did. And he got out. I, I think he's still in but I think he uh, he got sick or something. But his work was amazing. There's a couple of people that actually do fabulous work, um, you know, uh, but but I, I couldn't do it. And when I realized that it was about all about the colors, you are absolutely correct in my book, because I realized I could not consistently recreate certain colors. Sometimes you're going to win, but there was sometimes you just can't do it, in my opinion, without lights. So, uh, you know, it really, uh, that's why I went to lighting. Yeah, it is a, I, there's certainly a, a, a distinct advantage in being able to control uh, all of the light in your shooting environment. And when clients ask about that, uh, you know, why not do this? My answer is, I, I want predictable results. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, I need consistent results. They have to be predictable. I have to be able to tell you in advance, here is what we can do. Or if you come to me and say, hey, listen, uh, here's what I need. I need to be able to tell you, yeah, that's uh, that's not going to be a problem. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Dan. I think we've got to wrap it up. And I just want to say this has been certainly one of my favorite uh, interviews because uh, it, it really interesting and different stuff. And and some useful, useful information, pertinent information for everybody out there that uh, you can learn from. So I want to thank you so much for coming. You're very welcome. I hope I was uh, able to help some of your listeners. For Mm -hmm. sure. As a drone photographer, I've never even thought really until I, you know, was introduced to you through Rich of of doing stuff by helicopter. And, uh, you know, it's a whole new world of opportunity out there if I can convince some of my uh, (laughs) higher end luxury uh, luxury clients to go that way but in no means am i trying to become a uh, aerial photographer so you have nothing to worry about aerial aerial from the helicopter it's photographer a, it's a big market come on in hey <laughs> but i would love uh, if you would have me one day when you're on a shoot to uh, come and join I'd be you. happy to talk about that offline no problem that, that'd be great um but i want to thank you for coming on this was definitely as rich said enlightening and uh even not only just talking about your aerial stuff, but even just your regular um, ground, if you want to call it, your photography and a little bit of your technique. I know we didn't dive too much into your technique as far as shooting um, either aerial or ground, but just a little insight as to what you do and, you know, from a luxury market standpoint. Maybe another time. Yes. And Dan, 
And Dan, please add in your, uh, take us out with your website and um, because people got to see your work. It's really uh, such a great learning experience looking at your work. And uh, I just going to leave it at that. Sure. Well, the uh, website is milsteinphoto.com. And uh, again, I'm sure there'll be a link here. But uh, I will say most of my work is uh, is hidden. It's not there. It goes directly to the clients and uh, never sees the light of day for marketing. It's a very interesting way to do things. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, this is Rich with Shooting Spaces Podcast.com and reminding everybody to uh, please use that Ask the Guys feature because maybe we'll get Dan Milstein to uh, answer a question for you. And uh, I just want to say everybody shoot better, faster, smarter, and have a good time while you're doing it. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys. This has been Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Subscribe to the show and don't forget to leave us a review. You can also follow Rich and Brian on social media and at their website, shootingspacespodcast.com.